Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is Randy Welsh from the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. Thanks for joining us on this Tuesday for another in our continuing series of webinars for the wilderness stewardship community. Um, today, we're pleased to have Lauren Beretich with us from the Great Old Broads for Wilderness. And um, she's going to talk about balancing advocacy and stewardship to protect wild lands using the Great Old Broads for Wilderness as our model. But before we start that, I just wanted to make note of a couple of things. Um, I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy at home. I hope that um, you're able to um, continue in your great wilderness stewardship work, even in these trying times with the COVID-19 crisis that we're all dealing with. I wanted to point out that if you were not aware, that you should go to our website uh, for several resources that can be useful for your wilderness stewardship organization as you're dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we held a town hall meeting with Ray Torres of the Forest Service uh, last week. And that recording is available, talking about how some other wilderness stewardship groups are dealing with the COVID crisis and a list of resources that are available for you and your organization uh, as you're dealing in these trying times. Um, we do have a COVID-19 working group that's trying to put together resources that will be useful for the wilderness stewardship community. Um, those are going to be updated on a recurring basis. Uh, the current products are available on our website as well. Just go to our homepage and you can find that information right there. All right. Well, with that commercial out of the way, um, we're, <laughs> pleased to, we're pleased to have Lauren here with us again from the Great Old Broads. Uh, Lauren's been the Associate Director at the Great Old Broads for the last two years, and she's been with the Great Old Broads for six years, starting out as their grassroots um, outreach um, leadership director. Um, great Old Broads has been an organization around for a long time. They have a great model of wilderness stewardship, and we're pleased to have Lauren here today to kind of describe it for us and, and how they're able to blend both advocacy and stewardship together. Um, before Lauren worked with the Great Old Broad, she was a, a teacher at Northern Arizona University working with students on community development. So this is all, all very well ties together. So I would just ask everybody that as we turn this uh, time over to Lauren for her presentation, we will have time at the end for questions. Um, also here with us is Dave Cantrell, our program's lead with NWSA. He'll be assisting me as we go through a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Again, on the right-hand side of your screen, there'll be a questions dialog box. If you should, um, as you're going through the presentation, if questions do come up, please just type them in. And at the end of the presentation, we will spend some time going through that in a Q&A format with Lauren. So again, I'll just turn the time over to you, Lauren. Thanks so much for being here today. All right. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much. Um, it's quite the an screen. honor to be here. And, oh, the here we screen go. is now yours. So, yeah. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and show the screen. How are we looking? Every, everything looking OK? Yep. It's looking okay. great. OK. Well, before I get started, I'll also just please ask for your patience. Um, I have a home office now, as I'm sure most people that are calling in have of some level, and so you just never know if the dog is going to bark or people are going to knock on the front door, <laughs> but we'll get through this together. Um, again, thanks so much, uh, Randy and David, for hosting this incredible webinar series. and. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, again, uh, I know that these are really strange times, um, but what a wonderful opportunity together to celebrate our wildlands out there, uh, their healing and nurturing offerings that they give us every day when we need to allow our brains to slow down and uh, our minds to expand and for um, our hearts to open a little bit during these times. Uh, we will get through this, and we are doing it together, so thanks for being a part of that system. 
Uh, balancing advocacy and stewardship is really one of Broad's go-to strategies to build effective and collective advocates for public lands. And I'm just so excited excited to be here to discuss this in further detail with you all today. Uh, let's see, how do I advance this? Okay, so um, today I'll present for about 30 minutes um, and encourage you all to use the comments button um, box with questions uh, right along the way. So if you have any questions or thoughts or ideas that you want to address later, we'll make sure that we get those um, uh, taken care of. And then I really look forward to a discussion at the end. Um, so welcome to the presentation. I'll go into a little bit about the Great Old Broads for Wilderness and our main focus areas, why we are wild for our public lands, the threats and challenges uh, that we're seeing across our public lands. Uh, I'm really excited about talking to you through an engagement and deep, connected, deep connection practice that allows stewards and advocates alike to dive deeper into their connection with wildlands and then in return, building very effective strategies for the protection of those lands. Okay. Great. So who are we? Well, the Great Old Broads for Wilderness has been around now, we're celebrating over 30 years as a nonprofit organization um, since 1989 in honor of the Wilderness Act. Uh, the Great Old Broads is a national grassroots organization led by women that engages and inspires activism to preserve and protect wilderness and wild lands. We bring a tremendous amount of knowledge, leadership, and humor to literally every aspect of our work. This is through education, engagement, and advocacy. Uh, we organize uh, nationally through a full-time staff of just 10 of us, and regionally with our grassroots trained women's led broad, uh, broadband chapters across the country. Uh, we're in 16 cents, uh, states represented by 40 different chapters, and these are all facilitated by 70 volunteer trained women. Um, and they inform public lands protections all the way from their just regional backyards um, to the steps of Washington, D.C. Uh, brother, passionate, dedicated, and collective voices of women and men of all ages and different demographics fighting the good fight and taking a leadership role in championing the connection between the conservation and restoration of public lands. And of course, along the lines with that is climate mitigation. So I threw this gorgeous quote in here because I think that we can all resonate with it in some way. I only went out for a walk and finally concluded to stay out till sundown. For going out, I found, was really going in. And I feel as if John Muir really spoke to our hearts um, Anytime we have the opportunity to step out of our front door, we have an opportunity to connect not only with the wild, natural, living world around us, but and so also with ourselves. It's a time to um, inspire our senses and also start really paying attention and listening to the world around us. Um, thank you for the introduction. Just a little bit more about myself. Um, I, ma I graduated with a master's of sustainable community development from NAU, Northern Arizona University, based in Flagstaff, and studied grassroots organizing for sustainable community development and a shift in higher education practices. So I've been doing a lot of education and a lot of grassroots work. It's quite an honor. Uh, before that, I was working through the Grand Canyon Trust as a volunteer coordinator. And so I was in the field for about 10 months out of the year for years, coordinating uh, groups of people of all different ages um, on stewardship projects across the Kaibat Plateau. Some of my favorite work in the world. Um, and then I also felt, um, really compelled by the environmental education movement and practices. And I 
was on the board of Friends of Camp Colton and also taught and wrote curriculum for the sixth grade environmental education center for years and years and served on their board as well. So lots of lots of different hats for us to all get to where we are and truly start diving into this work in a way that we know we can be the most effective in it. I feel as if when we're able to share our passion for the natural living world, it is inevitable that we will make these connections with other people around us. Sometimes this is totally unexpectedly, and it brings us closer together to find and explore and identify different commonalities. And those commonalities are the building blocks to build power and change. And we know that when we're working on our wild lands, we really want to be effective in the work that we're doing to protect them and celebrate them every day. Well, I know because you all are on the call, that we share a common interest that we are absolutely wild for our wild public lands. And we know that there is such a diverse landscape out there to play and escape into and explore and research. Um, broads are so dedicated to preserving America's cherished public lands and wilderness. We can all think about that place that we go that means something really deep to us. It opens up our eyes, um, fills our hearts, and, and um, enhances our senses. These are areas where we recreate, explore, learn from, we quiet our minds, we study, we're able to harvest, fish, hunt, escape, settle in, and, um, and really just find our best selves. Um, of course, our public lands are multi-use managed for a reason, and it's a good reason. However, we're seeing more and more often that the threats and challenges are becoming greater each day. So let's talk of just for a second about what some of those threats are. Our wild lands are indeed at risk, and as our populations grow and our needs grow greater, uh, we turn to our public lands for some of those resources, and unfortunately, they're not all created equally. So, well, we know that they're under constant attack from resource extraction to logging to climate change to even just public recreation and heavy use. The broad categorized our focus areas and the issues into three focus areas, pardon. We believe that we want to keep wild lands wild and the Wilderness Act intact. We want to keep public lands in public hands. And of course, we'd like to see public lands as the solution to the climate crisis versus being a part of the problem. If we plan and work collectively and build stakeholdership and true ownership in our communities and involve all voices, we can assure that these lands are protected, but it takes a process, and I'm excited to work through that process with you. So how in the heck do we do this work? So aligning advocacy and stewardship. I'd like to share with you a few fundamentals to effective um, advocacy and grassroots work. We all have a story, and um, Many of us, I'm sure, hold many stories. These experiences throughout our lives shape our values, ideas, and how we interact with the world. So once we identify these stories, we can truly shape them into public sharing. Once we do that, our private lives and, ag and agendas on how we view the world become these public beacons for change. One effective advocate, a um, way to be an effective advocate is use your public narrative to connect with others and listen to their stories. Again, it's a reminder that we are not alone and together we can build power through those commonalities. We're also most effective when we get outside with a purpose. So this is um, saying whether we go for a hike with a botanist or a birder, um, maybe we get on a river trip and we are counting bighorn sheep for the park service. Um, getting outside and creating a space for further and deeper exploration really helps us deeply connect with that place. 
And that creates effective advocacy because we know it in an intimate way, our landscapes in an intimate way. I also encourage you um, to make sure that we're learning for the experts. So congratulations, I am certainly not an expert, but we all are together in our own experiences and knowledge base in a variety of different areas of our work. Um, it's important that we don't go about this alone, that we continue to bring experts in and others that are experienced in the field and the campaigns that we're trying to work on, the stewardship projects that we're engaging with, um, and make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel or going at this alone. Uh, one of our favorite things is rolling up our sleeves. It's so important to get to know the dirt and the trees and the water and the air that we're working on uh, preserving uh, across wild public lands. And so getting intimately involved in a stewardship project or volunteering for a day, building an enclosure or exclosure for research, uh, counting um, birds or uh, doing baseline assessments before an invasive removal. All of these things give us tangible results that feel good and help us build that buy-in and stakeholdership that's really important to move to the next level. Um, I also encourage the identification of a focus. And what does this mean? This means that we can take on the world. We're always going to have a, a lot on our plates. And having a focus allows us to narrow down our passions and our energies into something that we can then develop a really great plan around and then implement that from an A to a Z. Again, our jobs won't be over at Z. Then we go back to A again. It's very cyclic. Um, it's a cycle for us. But having that plan allows others to join in and see the purpose and the path to get to a success. And then of course, uh, one thing that we forget to do often because we get busy and our work is not necessarily always easy or we don't have a tremendous amount of resources and in time or funding is celebration comes last. And I would encourage through this process that we remember to celebrate every single step of the way. Little wins are big wins. And people that are part of the celebrations are the people that are going to feel valued and they're going to stick around and they're going to be with you in the next step and the next step and the next step. And it's really important for morale and also a project to move forward that you take time to celebrate the little wins because sometimes that's all we've got. All right, please don't forget at this point to go ahead and type questions or comments into that box as, as we uh, continue on here. Um, so although Broad has been on the ground since our organization formed over 30 years ago, we formally established what are called Broad Walks and Broad Works in 2014. And since then, we facilitated over 30 events all over the country, bringing together hundreds of members and community partners to educate, steward the land, and campaign for the protection of uh, our wildlands. So what are these events and how does it tie in? Well, everything we talked about in that past slide is modeled through our broad walks and broad works. So our broad walks are week-long experiential um, campouts with a purpose. So we structure our events around either a defensive or an offensive campaign, and um, it's to pr protect a specific region and bring attention to that region. So whether that is something defensive, like preventing the Twin Metals mine from development on the Boundary Waters Wilderness Area boundaries, or promoting the designation of an area like Bears Ears to a national monument, uh, we've also hosted Broadwalks where we've drawn attention to um, forest, um, to national forest areas that we'd like to promote habitat connectivity and areas for our wildlife to um, move from one space to another more freely and thrive in those areas. Um, each broad walk shares a similar format. We dedicate an entire day to multiple stewardship projects, and that's either working with our federal agency partners, um, to nonprofits in the area, uh, but we try to bring the locals in and we think it's really important for us to lend a hand in 
be a part of the change in the system wherever we go. We also spend two full days with guided hikes and um, and interpretive tours of the area that we go to to really deeply connect and learn intimately what's happening in that area. Um, and then in the evenings, we have uh, local expert presenters coming in that are either published, researched through the university, through a federal agency, nonprofit leaders, business owners, and folks that can come in and give us their local and research perspectives on the campaign through a variety of different angles. For example, we just held our Don't Dam the Salmon broadwalk up in Idaho, and we had a few different nonprofits come and also um, and also tribal leaders from the Nimipu tribe who could talk about the dams, the lower four Snake River dams, um, and their impact on the tribe and their belief in the removal of those dams for the uh, restoration of that ecosystem. So we really tried to bring in a diverse uh, collective voice that can um, educate us and present us with a variety of angles on any campaign that we take on. Incorporated into this event is also our advocacy day. It's a time to reflect and act, to learn the most effective grassroots strategies that we're able to use together to move forward. This could be in the form of a letter writing campaign, taping videos, and of course, identifying campaign strategies and next steps so that when we leave our broad walks, we're able to continue to do this work and see these campaigns through fruition. And then, of course, we have our broad works. And those are multi-day events as well, but they are truly focused on the stewardship of um, a certain area, whether that's invasive species removal or monitoring project. Um, or a photo project, photo documentation, uh, landscape restoration projects are really important, again, because it reconnects people with the space and the tangible results that you see when you're working in those places, even with trail maintenance, really helps us um, feel connected to those places. And once we have that connection, we really feel uh, excited about making sure that they stay intact and protected. Uh, again, the evenings for our broad works are wonderful times to celebrate and have a happy hour and oh, it's a lot of hard work to so relax a little bit and then share and dialogue around the issues that are faced in that area and how we can be a part of the change. The best part about this model is that we are seeing it working, that place-based advocacy. We see that we connect deeply to the land through stewardship exploration, and of course, education, not only of ourselves, but what we can share back out to others. That inspires awareness. Awareness inspires ownership. Ownership inspires a love for a place and a passionate connection to that place, which then inspires a grassroots effort and action. Those efforts um, inspire change. It's a beautiful process. Um, this picture is actually of our broadband leaders board members and some of our staff on one of our broad walks up in um, Dillon, Colorado, um, up by the Continental Divide. Pretty amazing. So just to drive this home one more time, you'll see here a reiteration of an important checklist. Aligning stewardship and advocacy efforts marries these grassroots um, strategies that create effective outcomes and successes. So here, if we look at stewardship and advocacy, the stepping stones for success in both of these and marrying them is making sure they're place-based and experiential, rooting into the place and having an experience with that place, again, creates ownership and loyalty to that place. Um, making sure that we're doing this through a grassroots and community-driven effort meaning from the ground up, the people that are locals, all people involved, that we are building community partnerships that are sustainable and long-term, and then it's driven by the local community themselves, 
and that we are assuring that when we engage in a stewardship and advocacy campaign, that it is through the needs that are requested from the local communities and not just the way that we feel that things should be done. It's also really important that it's focused and winnable. Um, it, um, sometimes our campaigns are, or even stewardship projects can feel very daunting, um, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel and there are some wins um, involved. And if you can identify what a win would look like, and you're in it for the long term, then you have a great focus area and a campaign uh, process in place and you're ready to move forward with it. It's also really important, again, to see the short and learn long-term value. Uh, once you see those, then you can also communicate and articulate that back to the communities that you're working with, whether they're volunteers, other nonprofits, elected officials, and, um, and once you start to feel and express that value and other people are on board, you'll gain a lot of momentum and power. And then, of course, it, that you're making sure that these are very celebratory. Every step of the way needs to be fun in some way. Even some of the hardest stewardship projects where you're working with barbed wire fences or advocacy campaigns where you just feel like you're swimming uphill. Understanding the wins and, and identifying the successes and celebrating the people that are involved and, and little, little wins along the way go a very long way. Again, these are shared in both our stewardship and our advocacy efforts. So this is um, a wonderful author, advocate, um, and um, she is Terry Tempest Williams. I'm sure you've heard of her. These are our broads in action around a quote that I just love from her. And it's, I pray to the birds because they remind me of what I love rather than what I fear. At the end of my prayers, they teach me how to listen. And I feel like the idea of listening is so very important. We need to listen to our volunteer communities. We need to listen to our experts. We need to listen to science. We need to listen to the natural living world around us because there is a story that it is telling us. Um, and it alleviates this idea that we can't create change because we can. And we need to hear that we can create that change. We need to have that mantra within us so that we can then relay that message back out uh, to our communities. And these are our breaths making that magic happen from Maine to California to Alaska, um, all across the, the country. So I think, yes, that is where we will end. I want to thank you again so much. It's such an honor to be a part of the environmental and stewardship communities doing work that feels so good and so meaningful every day and brings value. Uh, to the world in a time where it's feeling very challenging. And also, I just am so grateful for the broad women's leadership and, and having the opportunity to partner with you all today. So thanks a bunch. I guess we could open it up for questions. Okay. All right, Lauren. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, I think as I was listening, I, I think, um, People might be wondering if you could maybe point out um, some of the different types of work, work that the rods are doing in different locations around the country, just to get an example of some of the, the ways that you are getting that work out and then combining advocacy with it. Um, Absolutely. You want to share so, what's going on in some of the chapters? Yes, so we're so lucky. We have a grassroots leadership program um with three staff and we've really grown that over the years and had uh the gift of being able to expand our outreach effort to our grassroots chapters across the country um uh in those 40 chapters their work can be very similar and also differ in a variety of ways um our northwest pacific northwest broads um across quite a few states um up northwest are working on the removal of the Lower Snake River dams. They're also um, 
looking at um, whoops, uh, forests and climate change and our carbon sequestration and connection to our uh, ecosystems and riparian areas up north. Uh, we are also working on, um, I guess I wish I had our grassroots leadership director on here to represent some of the chapter's activities a little bit better. Um, I can say that we've been working to protect and promote the restoration of our national monuments that we've seen uh, reduced at such great levels like Bears Ears or Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Um, we also, our broads are involved in quite a few uh, monitoring, river monitoring projects. I know in New Mexico specifically, uh, our Colorado broads are working a lot and um, quite a, putting a lot of time to work with um, the uh, working towards habitat connectivity and reducing impacts of recreation looking at trail use and new trail development and proposals. Uh, so it is across the board. We're also looking at things like um, resource management plans and national forest uh, planning processes and um, uh, travel management plans. So we work on uh, policies that are on the federal, also on the state level, again, with the oil and gas lease sales, and we're seeing that we're, there's still requests for new leases. Uh, some of our uh, broads are working on assuring that we are keeping it in the ground, if you will, or the King campaign, depending on the area. So there is a, a, a lot happening across each state. And um, again, so something from a very local level to something on a national scale. I know locally the Cascades Volcano Chapter has been receiving some NWSA grants to do wilderness stewardship performance work, has been doing solitude monitoring in a number of the mm -hmm. wilderness areas along the Cascade fronts. And we just had a note from Ann saying that the South San Juan Broad um, Band has been using crosscut saws to open up trails uh, to just show that they aren't needed, that mechanical devices like chainsaws mm -hmm. are not needed um, so maybe a, a few, you've got a few more other examples like that and um, to help prime the pump of our audience it's now your turn audience to to type in some questions for lauren here um anything that that triggered your interest during the presentation or other things that maybe you'd like her to talk about um, with the great old broads that maybe were wasn't covered in the presentation so we'll give that just a few minutes. Um, Dave, do you have any questions for Lauren while we're waiting? Lauren, I do. I, I'm wondering how the pandemic is affecting your work. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, we are still moving forward with as much momentum as we are able. However, because um, this has had such a hard economic hit, of course, uh, we are worried about um, our financial stability, although we are doing the best that we can to launch new strategies for grant proposals, fundraising, membership. We just all know that we are in a tougher position as far as that goes. Secondly, our broad walks and our broad works and our events, like our wilderness advocacy leadership training, the WALT training, is for any new leaders that are coming into to training grassroots and leadership development uh, to run a broadband chapter. And we are now asked to do that uh, remotely. So our events are getting put on pause. It's really difficult time to engage people in large groups when we're not supposed to be in any group. So that has really slowed us down as far as the events go. But my goodness, have we thought creatively and um, and taken innovation to a new level. Uh, we're hosting tons of webinars. Uh, we're rescheduling things for the fall and still engaging in trainings and workshops online. Um, we've rescheduled our hosting climate broad walk, the main reason to ask, which is obviously in Maine. 
to next June as opposed to this one. Um, and then we are just, we have our seatbelts on and we're holding on tight and working as hard as we can through times where we're not able to be in person. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, along those lines, we uh, have seen where like the BLM has been continuing to announce lease sales. Uh, there's been mm -hmm. other policy, policy implementation things that have um, been proposed that are may or may not get enough public input and attention to that we know are negative for the environment. What are some mm -hmm. strategies that Broads is employing? What's some strategies that Broads is employing to keep get the word out and to make sure people are um, aware of some of these changes that are going on and, and how people can get engaged and involved on that advocacy front because it does affect stewardship. It sure does. I, I would suggest that being um, two or three steps approach, pronged approach. The first one is to connect with your local chapter. If you're uh, lucky enough to have one in your area, um, they're so active and so local and they're hosting public meetings, but online to do letter writing campaigns and to educate uh, groups in their area on things they're working on. And then you can, join them in these efforts. So that's on a local and a regional level. The second thing I would suggest is to sign up on our mailing list. We put out action alerts uh, at least once a month. And if there is an emergency or something that is very timely, of course, we'll put out an action alert uh, faster than that once a month time. And usually that's one to two different areas that people can uh, speak up on right away. For example, the EPA's uh, environmental rollbacks during COVID or um, a resource management plan that we could comment on or removing wolves from the endangered species list, right? These are constant battles. Our environmental bed, our bedrock environmental laws, NEPA, these things are under attack constantly. And anything that we can do to continue to create awareness and then send these action alerts out bring people uh, up to speed on the issue. We provide links and provide a really nice synopsis for it. And then there's always a, here are some suggested talking points, here are ways to act today, and then stay tuned for future actions as well. And then thirdly, our work section is becoming more populated on our website. And so always just checking in on the website as well and staying and trying to figure out what's going on out there. Are, with everybody staying home right now, are there other specific um, action items that you think people can be doing? Uh, anything that you would want to suggest that people can can keep vigilant on um, to further the cause while we're in this lockdown mode? That's a great question. <sighs> um, I think we need to stay as present and as um, on top of policy and politics and <laughs> the shift in environmental protections as we can. And so I would suggest that this is the time to dive into your current events, learn as much as you can about what's happening in your backyards and how they're being taken care of. Um, Hop on any of your favorite national profit, you know, conservation listservs um, and start following what they're sending out because things are happening. There's unfortunately job security for all of our work right now. Um, this administration is, is not um, the easiest as far as promoting environmental conservation and preservation. So there's a lot of work to be done. If you're bored, get in touch with us and we will have things for you to do. Um, but really, um, if you could have your elected officials on speed dial, that, that, that part of the movement has not slowed down. Let them know you're continuing to pay attention to the things that are important to you, whatever your focus area and campaigns are. Continue to push as hard as you can for climate action and advocacy. Um, we, have, we have got to be as strong advocates as we can to relieve our public lands from the pressures and the stresses that are they're under. Uh, 
for resources that are impacting our climate. We really don't have too much time left to not have acted yesterday. So starting today is a great time for everyone to get involved, both politically, socially, economically, and then staying as educated as you can. But if you're an expert in an area, put as much information out there as you're able and be, be the resource for others. All right. Um, Marilyn had a question coming from the Midwest is how does one get involved in a great old broads either work project or um, other activities and are there any activities going on in the Midwest with great old broads? Yes and yes. Thank you Marilyn. Welcome. Um, we have a chapter in Minnesota. Uh, and we were working quite a bit on the boundary waters protection of the wilderness area but um other they've adopted um oh my goodness what are they called um portals or where you put your canoes in um mm -hmm. but they've adopted those areas as stewardship places to keep it um cleaned up as well so i would just suggest going on our website and signing up for our online newsletter and also requesting to be connected with our broads up in Minnesota. Um, and we can do that through our grassroots leadership program and through our membership. All right. Lauren, there's um, a question. Have a question. Go ahead, Dave. Okay. Um, there's a question here which I can quickly answer and questions are really rolling in. But uh, to mention to everyone that the full webinar with all of the slides will be available on the NWSA website. So if you came in late, if your bike broke down and you came in late, you can still get to the materials. Uh, mm -hmm. Kathy wonders, uh, what other organizations do your broadbands work with to accomplish common goals? Oh my goodness. Um... That is a great question, and it's a very uh, uh, region-specific question. Um, uh, the Wilderness Society, um, Sierra Club, uh, these are all national. Um, uh, CBD, um, or I'm sorry, Center for Biological Diversity, uh, Grand Canyon Trust. These are some of the real big players that we work with all the time. Conservation Colorado. Um, San Juan Citizens Alliance, ONDA, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I want to call the acronym police on myself. Um, oh gosh, there are just so many partners, uh, but really, it, um, it just really depends on the local area. Of course, you all, the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance, um, Colorado Mountain Club, uh, we also, you know, those are all individuals, but I will say that we formed coalitions and our coalitions are um, ways for all of our um, nonprofits and, and organizations to join together so that we aren't just standing alone. And so something like CERCA or Southern Rockies Conservation Alliance is a group of us that come together. It's made up of 30 different nonprofits that allows us to do information sharing and just continue to um, share as much information and uh, opportunities for engagement across boundaries of, of our own individual organizations. So Lauren, what um, once we're through the COVID crisis and we'll be able to get our volunteer activities back up and running again, and it will happen every Is that tomorrow? <laughs> um, probably in May. Uh, with based on everything that we're hearing. Um, but what techniques do you use in Great Old Broad to follow up with volunteers um, on stewardship projects to engage them not only in future stewardship, but in um, future advocacy as well? So what, what's mm -hmm. specifically unique about Great Old Broads and the way they interact with their volunteers? So that's a great question. So one thing I want to share with that is that on a national level, we only have the capacity to host two or three um, stewardship projects a year because we're also doing our broad walks and then all of our advocacy focused campaign work. 
Um, but what we do is uh, when we build a partnership, we hope that it, it has a multi-year purpose or serves multi-years in a row so that if we're building a constituency of people who are really loving and learning the techniques and skills to get involved in a stewardship project, that we create the opportunities for the next year for them to go back and continue either in the same place or in an area next to it um, so that we're building these sustainable and long-term partnerships with groups in need of our stewardship work. So that's one part. Um, but I, but the second part I think that makes us unique is that our broadband chapters across the country are the ones that are the real go-to for this. These are the ones that are, are building um, partnerships that have um, just longevity and sustainability for every, you know, weekly, monthly, or annual trips, and they host them like that every single year. And so. Um, now, I think that our work as a national organization is unique in that we're women's led and also that we're an older demographic. And oftentimes we're told, you know, oh, we have this raking project that you can do because when we reach out, we're not necessarily taken seriously like we're going to have some folks who can do some really good work until we get out there. And so we bring an older demographic of men and women we're ready to do a day's worth, a week's worth of really hard work and show up and are willing to see it through fruition. Okay. All right, great. Um, the second part of that question was the, how do you get the volunteers motivated to write letters or to call their congressman? Um, and how, mm -hmm. what kind of things do you do to help encourage people to transition from stewardship into advocacy? So when you put those gloves on and work in an area, stories come up about that area. Maybe you see a plant that is really neat because it's adaptive in a certain way or only blooms once a year. And, it, and when it blooms, you have a moth that knows it's opening and comes down and pollinates it just during that time of year. And you're learning that while you're like digging a hole or something, right? And then um, you start talking about the river and the ecosystem that um, is all intact because of this and this, and you start making really wonderful and and, and, um, and connections that you wouldn't have known unless there was stories being shared about that space. And as you are watching your stewardship projects unfold, you're also starting to deeply connect with the place that you're working on through storytelling and and through this really cool science and um, ecology of a place. Um, at the end of the day, it opens up a discussion and a, and a space for dialogue on these are the things that are happening in this area that are actually threatening or challenging its health. Um, and these are things that you can do to get involved. How many of you want to share a story about your enjoyment or your connection to this place today? And you allow that to build more and more um, uh, appreciation for a space through storytelling. And, and once that happens, you have this really neat, fluid discussion going on and offering opportunities to get involved. And that's when we start talking about next week, this plan is coming out. And if there's a 60-day comment period, this is how we could tell our own stories connected to this place. And we encourage you to tell your stories that connect you to this place and why it means so much to be protected. And then we provide the science and the research and the talking points that are a little bit on the drier side that are, you know, the talking points to back up your personal narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of next week, Dave, do you want to take the next question from Kathy? You know, I was looking at um, dropping down. Well, yeah, let's do that one, right? Um, Kathy's wondering, do the Great Old Broads have anything special planned to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day on April 22? Well, that's a great question. We do. Um, I know that the Grassroots Leadership Program and myself are putting on the training for 
um, 14, I believe, I'd have to double check myself, new leaders. Um, and so for Earth Week, we're training new advocates and voices for chapter leaders. Um, we also have a membership promotion going on and with incentives, and you can go on our website to check out what those are. Um, but that just really helps us do our best work um, by just becoming a part of our team. And then I just saw the other day a circulation of um, a webinar that is through our climate education and stewardship program. Rachel Green, the program manager, is doing a webinar. I can send those dates out to you all and also go on our website to have a look um, on public lands and climate change. Wonderful. So I think we, um, we have time for one last question here and that's coming from one of our land agency partners. Um, they're wondering, how can a land management agency get involved with great old broads? How do uh, they believe in public partnership and public involvement? So how do they get involved with the great old broads in so their local, local unit, local agency? So it's, it's, that's gone both ways. So the broads have often um, wanted to create a stewardship project or um, a partnership in some way with the local federal agency, maybe a forest service rep or a leader in the field. And we've reached out to them, but we've also had our district rangers reach out to us and say, do you have anybody in my district? I have an idea as far as a forest or, or you know, as far as a project goes, or we need hands on the ground or we need eyes and ears. And especially during times like this, I really want to acknowledge the value of that question because our agencies funding is just cut to such a level that I think it would be really challenging to do the work that needs to get done out there without the support of the community and without the support of a volunteer team. So um, I would suggest um, my email is lauren at gradlebroads.org. If you want to email me with your request in your area and your location, I can um, connect you with our regional broadband coordinator who can also connect you with our local chapter leaders who are always loving to build those connections and relationships. All right. Well, I think um, that's the last question that we have. So um, we just want to say thank you to Lauren for coming on today and mm -hmm. providing our content for the National Wilderness Stewardship, Wilderness Stewardship Web webinars. Dave, thank you so much for your participation as well. And we thank all our audience for being here today. Uh, again, just note that those COVID-19 responses and um, town hall presentations are on our website now. And this presentation is being recorded, as Dave mentioned, and should be available later this week. Um, I think we're just getting some more thanks. So thanks, everybody, for attending today. Everybody stay safe, stay thank healthy, you. good social distancing. And um, we'll see you all next month when we, um, Dave, you want to mention the promo for what next month is all about? Uh, what is next month about? <laughs> uh, I have to look, look at this May. Anyways, well, it's on our website. Uh, next month, <laughs> we're going to have another, another great webinar, and uh, we'll see you there. May is citizen science. That's actually going to be a great one. It's been a long time since. All right. right. Yeah. More, yeah. more involvement with citizen science. I believe uh, a panel of people coming to talk about different work that they're doing with citizen science. So um, you can just register for that on our website starting tomorrow. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody again next month. So and for Lauren, NWSA. Uh, and Lauren. Uh, see you all later. Thank yous have been rolling in. Oh, great. Well, thank you all so very much. Thank you so much.